Good afternoon, everyone. We have the challenge of uh, energizing you again uh, after lunch. Can you all hear me? I hear a bit of an echo. My name is uh, Bart van der Sloot. I look after Global Crossing's business with the carriers and service providers in the Benelux and in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and I'm doing a presentation today with my colleague uh, Jos Martins, who uh, looks after our worldwide marketing activities for our carrier and uh, service provider business. A lot is happening in the internet today, and we thought it's good to share a number of updates with you, at least how we see things developing in the world. Uh, first of all, uh, a brief update on, on ourselves. Um, then we'd like to share our view on what's going around in the world in cloud computing and where you can find your place in the value chain on cloud computing. Uh, we saw some, a lot of press activity around net neutrality lately, uh, so we thought it's good to, uh, to cover that in our presentation. And last but not least, uh, we spend a bit of time on something that many of you may be struggling with. Uh, do I route my traffic through peering connections or do I send my traffic through, uh, through transit connections? What criteria sh should I use to make such decisions? And um, yeah, that will be the, the last topic of our presentation. If you have questions, feel free to, free to raise your hand during the presentation, but we would prefer to, to have them at the end. <clears throat> Let me first uh, take you through who we are and what we do. Uh, if you look at Global Crossing as a company, we basically provide three types of services. We provide big pipes to build internet backbones, so that could be dark fiber, wavelength, or ethernet services. Uh, we run one of the largest internet backbones ourselves, so that means we provide access to the global internet for ISPs, hosting companies, big enterprises and so on. And we have a portfolio of enterprise services, network services, uh, data center services, collaboration services, uh, IPVPN, Ethersphere, uh, anything that an enterprise might need. And we sell that not only directly through our own sales force, but also uh, in partnership with carriers and service providers. So if your company is in that business, please also have a chat with us to, to see what we can do together. We provide those services globally, uh, but our main strength is all what we call our global, our core network. Uh, so that's our network in Europe, North America, Latin America, and the oceans in between, where we build where we own and where we operate the physical network, including all the services layers on top of that. Now, we do it with a team of about 5,000 people, of which roughly 1,200 are, are in Europe. Um, if you look at the two sets of services which are probably most relevant for yourselves, first of all, it's our transport services, uh, so those big pipes to, uh, to build uh, internet backbones. Uh, I won't go in detail here, but now, basically, I think it's good to be aware that anywhere from Western Europe to Sao Paulo, we can del deliver you pipes on our own network uh, and where we fully have end-to-end -end control of quality and, uh, and service. The most relevant service for this audience, I would assume, is our IP transit service. I already said that we run, the, we run a large internet backbone. Uh, if you look at Renesis, a company does a lot of, that does a lot of market analysis on the internet, they rank us as the second largest network in terms of IP space transited through our network. Uh, I'll come back to that later. I think there's a number of topics which are interesting in our service and where we also differentiate from other providers. Uh, our network not only covers North America and Europe, but it stretches all the way to Latin America and also Asia and Australia. Uh, we have a strong focus on network security, so that means we put a lot of effort into keeping malicious traffic off our network. And we're pretty rigid in keeping spammers from our network, for instance. And we try to protect our customers as good as possible, uh, as possible against, uh, for instance, DOS attacks. We were the first to deploy IPv6 globally in our network. Uh, we actually did that back in 2006. And uh, let me use that opportunity also to draw attention to the next speaker, uh, Gregor Janoska of LeaseWeb, who will share his experiences of implementing IPv6 in the hosting network. Um, and we have direct connectivity to a lot of large internet destinations. Not only all the large content providers are directly connected on our network, either as a peer or as a customer, but also a lot of the content distribution networks and a lot of the, uh, the major access networks. <coughs> 
In the last two years, we've invested a lot in expanding our network towards Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, we opened uh, about eight pubs in Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, um, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, and we're close to finalizing the uh, completion of our pop in Kiev as well. Uh, so that means also in those countries we can get closer to our customers and we can get more big internet destinations uh, on a network. And all these pops are connected obviously with diverse routes back to the, uh, the rest of our, uh, of our network. We already briefly touched on, uh, on Renesis, and uh, I thought it's good to spend a little bit more detail because this also links to some of the other topics that we'll be, uh, be covering in our presentation. This is a graph that Renesis published by the beginning of this year, and it basically ranks the 13 largest IP backbones in terms of transited IP space. Now, what, what do we see here? Uh, and it's a bit hard to see with all the colors, but there's clearly one market leader, one biggest network, and uh, that is level three. There used to be a clear number two, uh, the light blue or the grayish one, which is, uh, which is Sprint. But you can see that Sprint's share in this market has declined significantly during 2010. Now, what happened? They decided that they don't want to be a big player in this wholesale, wholesale IP market. They decided to spend their capex elsewhere. And so they're gradually pulling out of this market, which means that our company, Global Crossing, has developed into a, a clear number two. Um, and NTT seems to be currently develop, be developing into a, a clear number three. And then there's a host of other players, including Telios Anera, Tata, Kojin, TINet, most of them which are, are represented obviously in this conference. But this is basically giving you a relative view on the size of all those networks. Now what does that all mean for you? And I'm especially addressing the you if you run an IP network. And what does it mean connecting to a tier one? Why is it beneficial compared to connecting to a smaller player? What does it mean that an IP network covers five regions instead of being just active in Europe and North America? And what does it mean, all this expansion? Now, basically, on our network, roughly 50% of all traffic, of all customer traffic, stays on net. And so that means we actually have end-to-end -end control of the traffic. We can much better control packet loss, latency, we can much better protect that traffic against all kinds of malicious traffic than a provider could do which handles 70 or 80 percent of their traffic through peering connections. And so at the end of the day, this translates into better user experience for your customers and lower cost to run your networks. Um, <coughs> Let me go back to the, the Renesis picture. Uh, we saw 13 big IP networks all fighting for market share. <laughs> Can you uh, turn this one off? <laughs> I think this why I was just want to say that. Uh, this is just a, a proof that we actually do protect our, uh, <laughs> not only our IP network, but also our IP, our, uh, our computers uh, very intensively. Uh, we saw 13 companies fighting for market share. We see some companies pull out, uh, Sprint was an example, I think Verizon pulled out at an earlier stage already, but we still see a lot of companies fighting for that market share, which has a, a tremendous impact on pricing. Now, I think for those who are, of you who are operating this market, you all know that IP, IP transit prices tend to decline 40, 50 percent per year, and that also means that a lot of companies run their network at much higher fill grades than we used to do four or five years ago. And I'm not saying that the internet will stop, as this picture seems to, uh, seems to indicate, but there is a risk that if the market just continues like this, uh, that the quality of service in the internet is actually just getting worse. While on the other hand, the internet is getting much more critical for any business, business transaction you might imagine. Now, Sprint has taken the decision to pull out of that market. Uh, they spend their capex on their mobile activities. Uh, our company has decided, uh, and the shareholders in our company, to uh, merge with the number one player in this market. Uh, I trust many of you have seen the announcement that was made uh, back in April, uh, which is on this slide, where Level 3 and Global Crossing, and of course the shareholders behind those, announced their intention to, uh, to combine the two companies through an acquisition of Global Crossing by Level 3. Now, what does that mean? Uh, that means that a new very powerful company will exist 
um, which ha will have its challenges to integrate, but which will have a huge set of assets to handle global, global internet traffic. If you look at it, the Global Crossing Network, it already covers Latin America, Asia and Australia, where level three's main strength, as you can see in the red lines on this slide, was in, uh, in US and Europe and, uh, and, the, Trans and, and the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, level 3's CDN facilities and metro assets are very complementary to global crossings capabilities. And so the, the combination of the combined company, of the combination of those companies, really provides an internet powerhouse yeah, which has a, a very strong platform to, uh, to further grow and to make sure that yeah, the internet becomes more stable and that there's not hundreds of small players all killing each other on price and all uh, running their networks at, at too high fill rates. Now, some numbers on the combined company. Um, the combined company will have roughly $6.3 billion in revenues. Uh, roughly 70% of those revenues come from customers in the US, roughly 20% uh, from Europe. and. Roughly 55% of those companies generate revenues in the enterprise side of the business, and roughly 45 on the, on the wholesale side. If you have any questions, feel free on those numbers, but uh, I won't bore you too much with, uh, with all that detail. One point is maybe good to highlight is if you look at the expected EBITDA, so let's say profit numbers, uh, then the company actually expects to generate roughly 300 million extra EBITDA through that acquisition. Now, obviously, those 300, billion, uh, 300 million dollar come from expected uh, cost saving through synergies. So far, an introduction on uh, who we are, what we do, and especially on uh, recent developments. What this means for you, the integration with Level 3, uh, will become much more clear when that transaction has closed, which we expect will happen very early in the fourth quarter. Let me hand over to, uh, to Jos. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jos Martens. Um, for something completely different, uh, I would say uh, uh, we like to talk a bit about uh, uh, cloud computing. Um, as Bart said, um, a big chunk of our revenue comes out of the enterprise market. With Global Crossing, more than 70% of our revenue comes out of enterprise. So for us there, cloud computing is a, a, an important uh, uh, technology which we need to follow. Um, some points of view on, on cloud services. Um, it is more than just computing, and perhaps as an anecdote, uh, I used to work for Philips Business Communications uh, up to 2000, and my last uh, task there was business development uh, assignment to develop a hosted PBX service. So we were very good at uh, uh, deploying uh, boxes all around the world, putting PBXs at, at enterprises, and then we thought, well, with the internet, we could uh, develop a, a hosted PBX as well. So we started uh, developing that, had a lot of discussions in the US and, and also with, with big carriers on, well, would you be interested in that? Everyone was interested in that, of course, certainly in that uh, period. Um, but it never took, any, took us anywhere, because if you look at 2000 or 1999, the internet was there, but not as much as it is available now. If you look at access, DSL, was just around the corner, I would say. So the access methods into enterprises and, and, and homes was not as much developed as it is now. Right now, if you look at the internet, everyone knows it, everyone uses it, and everyone expects it to be available, reliable, etc. So a lot has changed, I think, in the past 10 years, which makes cloud computing much more attractive and, and f uh, feasible than it was before. Um, some very basic cloud computing applications which we all know, and you could doubt, well, is this really cloud computing? But, but Skype is a kind of a cloud computing. It's a service in the cloud, and I think about 30 or 40% of all international voice traffic is now handled by Skype. So it's a big, important player in, in, in the market. Uh, that's a, a picture of Dropbox. I'm not sure whether you're familiar with Dropbox, but if you have an iPad and want to get some files on your iPad, the only way I find out that really works is Dropbox. You can get three gig of, uh, of capac storage capacity uh, on the internet. You just put your files there and you can access your files from everywhere uh, around the world. So it's a very easy way where you sh uh, share a resource in, in, the, in, in, the, in, in the network where you can store your files. This is the new sign for 
iCloud, the uh, application which uh, Apple probably will launch uh, with iOS uh, uh, 5. <coughs> well, you can really look at uh, your music. Uh, they, you can synchronize with the cloud all your music. If Apple has a better version of that a certain song than you have uh, on, on your iPad or on your, on your computer, it will automatically update it with a better uh, version of, of that song and a higher quality. So a, a lot is happening and is coming to the consumer market. Um, last week I was in Capacity Africa in Kenya and I had a long chat with uh, uh, broadband and cloud services there. Even in Kenya and Africa, they are looking at cloud services right now. And you can imagine, well, uh, is the access already available there? There are some fiber to the home projects, but they don't think they can ignore the whole cloud uh, uh, computing uh, stream which is happening right now. They also want to have that own dedicated app store um, because they don't think that all the Africans can pay the prices which you typically pay in, an, in the Apple App Store or elsewhere. So they want to develop that themselves. So w what is really different in the cloud uh, than uh, is with, with normal applications? Um, services can be con consumed uh, remotely over the network. Um, you need to be able to grow and scale uh, uh, your application. And I think also what is important is the consumption model. So people expect a fixed price per seat or based on usage and to, and instead of uh, a, a port or a fixed price based upon 400 users or for 200 users at, at, at once. And wh what also is happening is you move more or less the applications from the local area network to the wide area network. And that's where a player like Global Crossing likes to be active as well because we're not as much active on the local area network, we are active in the wide area network. So that's certainly a place where we think we can uh, give some benefits to our customers. Uh, this is some, so, some information from Gardner. Um, I think you can all see that, uh, of course, there's a big opportunity and you never know uh, whether that will, will come true uh, in the future or not. We think uh, um, there is growth in cloud computing, everything, everyone sees that as well, I think. Um, some of the uh, reasons why it is inevitable, as I showed, people are getting used to things in the cloud we, with social media, we, with storage, etc. So the time is there also to, 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 to move that to the enterprise environment. Um, still some concerns, of course, for, with, with the CIOs, like security, performance, integration, availability. But I think if you look at the availability of the internet and of the network and of VPN services, uh, that's certainly something which is controllable and very well doable now to give uh, the end users and the enterprise a very good, uh, reliable service. Um, Global Crossing, what, what are we doing? I want to touch upon two uh, examples. One is communications as a service and the other one is security as a service. Uh, communication as a service is something which we rolled out earlier this year for our enterprise customers. Uh, and security as a service, we're launching still a premise-based, uh, we have launched a premise-based solution, but we are developing that to become a cloud-based solution as well. So I want to touch briefly upon that as well. Um, communication as a service, w what is it and w what have you launched there? Global Crossing is one of the, the bigger uh, 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 conferencing suppliers globally. Uh, we have about uh, 250 uh, billion, a million a minutes uh, a month on, on our uh, uh, conferencing uh, platform. Um, but, and if you look at that, it is... Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, it is something which uh, the, the, the audio bridges are in the network and people dial into that. Now, that's a very basic uh, solution. Uh, wh what we've done is we developed APIs to integrate that with enterprise applications. So we integrated it with Outlook, we integrated it with Lotus Notes. So if you have an appointment in your calendar, it automatically looks at your calendar and notifies you you have an audio conference or you have a web conference. We integrate this al also with smartphones. So we have apps for BlackBerry, for iPhone, for Android, which really integrates with our uh, collaboration platform. So on your iPhone, you just see you have a conference call and you click on join 
and the bridge tells you. So this is the example of uh, the desktop uh, version uh, where you can see what well, these are my meetings, join, you can even automatically join at a certain moment in time. So with your computer, it's integrated with your uh, conferencing bridge. And the bridge calls you instead of you calling the bridge, which is very convenient. You don't need to remember the number, you don't need to remember the PIN number, etc. What's also important is the per seat price. So it's not a metered solution anymore. We give our end customers a fixed price per month for all the co collaboration needs. Uh, security solutions, uh, something which we uh, launched earlier this year. Um, I have some statistics uh, uh, on, on security, but it, it is a challenging environment. And I, I saw a presentation earlier this morning, although it was in Polish, uh, about uh, DDoS and, and, and attacks, etc. It's still on the rise. Um, the increased use of wireless networks is certainly important there, which typically is a bit more vulnerable to, to, to attacks. Uh, remote employees uh, who want to get access to, to your uh, VPN network. Uh, social networks, which typically also a means for uh, or a, a position where people can get attacked or can uh, get viruses, etc. And also what is important, uh, governments start asking for compliance. This is from a uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, investigation. You see that still if you compare 2008 with 2010, there's a big increase in uh, organizations that have been affected uh, by malicious uh, software. And if I read those figures correctly, these are the attempts and these are the actual uh, uh, penetrations which are the same percentages. So a lot of the attempts are successful, I would say. Uh, so it is certainly something which needs to be addressed. Uh, there's, there's also a difference between large uh, and smaller organizations, um, uh, which you can see. Uh, there is uh, the average breach. Uh, imagine you have 45 breaches a year with a large organization and a small organization is up to f 14. You need to have staff for that to do that, uh, and it's something which you better can give to your, your provider to, to handle that for you. Costs are going up as well. 2008, it ranges from 90 to 170,000 uh, pounds, and right now it's about 280 to 690,000 pounds on average, which is quite a lot of, uh, of money. Next to your customers complaining, and also your reputation, which can be harmed. So what did we uh, develop? Um, we developed together with, uh, I would say, Fortinet and ArcSight, uh, a complete package uh, which enables us to offer our enterprise customers a true security application, where we include consulting. So we look at customers, see what the vulnerability is, what the usage is, and make a report to them, and also a security policy we develop for them. With Fortinet, we can apply uh, firewalls, uh, filtering, etc. And with ArcSight, together with our security operations center, we can manage, manage and monitor our enterprise customers' network. Right now, we still put the boxes on the customer prem. We are developing uh, tools and, 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 and solutions which will really make this a more cloud-based uh, solution, which is, I think, something which we can, uh, which our customers can benefit from. And that gives me the mic to part again. Yeah, thank you. A lot of press articles on net neutrality in the last couple of weeks, and uh, yeah, let me take you through, uh, through what we've been seeing. Uh, first of all, yeah, what is it? It's basically the principle that advocates that service providers and to some extent also governments should treat all services equally in the network. So they should not stop certain services or they should not charge extra for certain services. And of course the big debate is should this be determined in legislation or regulation or should it be left to, uh, to competition and, and market dynamics? Um, the term used to be a really US-centric term, but I think more recently in the last six months, the topic also pops up more in Europe. 
Now, one of the updates in the US, uh, the FCC, uh, so basically the regulator in the US, has announced that it will regulate net neutrality uh, in, on, the, on the 20th of November this year. I think there's still a lot of doubt in the US if that will really happen, and I think uh, with the, uh, the power that some of the large networks have, this may not happen at all. But you can see there's a drive in the US to s make sure that net neutrality is really, really, really defined in regulation and legislation and that it's not left to, uh, to the markets. Uh, the Netherlands are Belgium, and Belgium are, are trying to make big steps. Uh, Netherlands tries to also implement a law uh, before the end of this year, which basically determines that service providers, especially the service providers, uh, the, the mobile service providers, are not allowed to, for instance, stop Skype or to put a different price tag on, uh, on ping or, or other type traffic, which eats away their revenues. Same in Belgium. Uh, I think today the only country in the world that has net neutrality regulated is in Chile, but Netherlands and Belgium try to be uh, the number two and the number three. And also obviously uh, at the European level there are steps being made to define a framework uh, at the European level that the individual countries then can use to base their legislation upon. Now, why is this all happening? Uh, as we all know, video dominates internet traffic. Whether it's on fixed networks or mobile networks, a video is already more than 50% of all internet traffic. Um, and that means that the access networks, uh, the fixed and both, that, and both the mobile networks, they have huge investments to keep up with all that traffic. And not, not only do they have huge investments, uh, they also have more and more competition uh, from the so-called over-the-top service providers who use all those investments to provide free of charge typically services to those end users. Uh, and what we see is services that used to be important revenue generators for these operators, be it phone calls or be it SMS, are simply replaced by alternative services. Uh, you also already mentioned Skype as an example. Uh, in the Netherlands, KPN announced that their SMS revenues were really suffering big time from, uh, from Ping and WhatsApp, uh, which are basically free of charge applications which do the same thing as SMS. And furthermore, if you look at the pricing of fixed internet services, typically it's still a fixed fee which is not usage based. Uh, so heavy users pay the same thing as, uh, as light users. Um, a study has been, this has created a lot of debate, also at the European level, and uh, Nelly Cruz, who's the EU Commissioner for, uh, for IT and Telecoms, has basically started an initiative uh, to work with a lot of the key, IP, uh, the key internet players to come with something that works for all players in the industry. Now, that's easier said than done. Uh, the incumbent carriers, uh, the Telefonica's, Deutsche Telekoms, etc., have come together and have, uh, have issued uh, a study through uh, AT Kearney. And basically, the main conclusion of that study was that yeah, we need to agree on some kind of definition of how the internet is structured, and of course, over time, there needs to be regulation which makes sure that their interests are protected. Now, at the same time, uh, there were after this study was completed, there was a second study that actually criticized the conclusions from the A.T. Kearney report. And to, to share a bit more uh, on those studies, A.T. Kearney basically defined the value chain of the internet into a number of players. At the left side, you see uh, basically the content owners, or the owners of content rights. Uh, then the next uh, are the online service players, and there's basically where you see the Skype, the Facebooks, the Yahoo's, etc., popping up as companies that provide a big threat to those companies that are expected to uh, invest in, in access networks. There's the enabling technology services, there's the connectivity networks, like ourselves for international connectivity, but of course also like Deutsche Telekom, France Telekom for in-country connectivity, and there's the, uh, the user interfaces uh, and the devices that people use. So the AT Kearney report basically drew a number of conclusions which basically said, okay, the investments that we as incumbents have to make are clearly unsustainable. Uh, we cannot keep up with, uh, with uh, this, uh, this um, uh, level of investments if our revenues are not protected in one way or another. 
But actually, I think you can put a question mark behind that because, yeah, we all agree that big networks require big investments, uh, but it's not so that all these online service providers, that they all are financially healthy and grow like hell. Uh, maybe that's valid for Google, maybe that's valid for Facebook, but of course there also used to be MySpace and there used to be lots of social networks that you could also categorize as online service providers, but these have virtually disappeared. Uh, so it's not that only online service providers make all the money and the access networks are only, uh, only invested, uh, requested to invest in those networks. What we see around us today is, on one hand, the attempts to implement legislation, but we also see a lot of, let's say, private initiatives. Uh, we see that mobile operators start to move away from a fixed fee for unlimited internet usage to uh, a structure where you can have up to so many megs or so many gigs per month. Uh, we see similar movements in the fixed <coughs> internet industry. Uh, the funny thing is that the Belgian market uh, basically seems to be pretty advanced in that sense. I think most markets have um, uh, free unlimited use of, of bandwidth in fixed service, uh, fixed type services. But in Belgium, traditionally, Belhacom and Telenet, who are the main ISPs in Belgium, they already had a cap on the maximum amount of content you could download. Uh, they seem to be moving away from that. Uh, on the other hand, we see movements in the rest of Europe that service providers are moving towards putting a cap on, uh, on the maximum terabytes you can download in a month or charging heavy users extra for, uh, for that heavy usage. Uh, we also see that those online service providers start to make private deals with some of the access providers. Uh, some of them are trying to do deals where at least their service gets priority treatment on the network of that specific uh, provider. So at least that service comes through with a good end user experience. Google and Verizon uh, is an example uh, of that. <coughs> and some companies try to start charging or completely blocking those applications. Uh, I think KPN in the Netherlands was a good example when they announced their quarterly numbers uh, over Q1. Uh, they basically announced that their SMS revenues had dropped by 20% because of Ping and WhatsApp. And they had decided to block WhatsApp and Ping from the mobile internet service uh, and to start charging extra for those services. Now, this creates such a pushback in the uh, Dutch internet market that actually the government stood up and said, okay, if you guys want to do that, we are going to really accelerate uh, net neutrality in our regulation. Uh, so that's why the Netherlands jumped up as, uh, yeah, as a country that really wants to be uh, upfront in, uh, in regulation of uh, net neutrality. Another example is uh, Vodafone, which uh, uh, tries to, uh, to charge extra for uh, Skype usage. I don't know if that's the case in all countries, but in the UK they, they definitely do that. Uh, so the main conclusion is uh, there's a lot going on in net neutrality, not just on the regulatory and legislation side, but also in all kinds of private initiatives. Where that will lead us, uh, we'll see. Uh, I think the initiative to come to some kind of framework of the internet and all the players that play in the value chain is definitely good. Uh, but there also will be eternal discussions on what that model looks like, and once we've defined it, some kind of new company pops up and uh, um, yeah, doesn't fit into, uh, into that, uh, that structure. And the question really is, yeah, do we really need legislation, regulation, or are consumers basically able to move to another provider, and if they don't like what their current provider does, they simply walk away, so let the market decide how their service providers should treat their service. That's an update on the net neutrality. Jos, back to you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, transit and, and peering. Uh, as Bart already said, uh, pr prices of transit are, are declining uh, rapidly and, and traffic is growing rapidly as well. So uh, I think Bart uh, did a presentation here at PLNOC, I think, uh, two years ago about the different peering cultures. And you can say, well, they range from ver very formal to very informal, uh, uh, I would say. Um, so 
Uh, appearing colleges is something which all is defined per country uh, uh, and also which is more or less historically uh, uh, um, um, defined. If you, if you look at transit versus peering, uh, transit is a very simple service from a customer perspective. Uh, you, you, you pay your upstream provider and all traffic, uh, you, uh, you can get access to the full internet uh, by your upstream provi provider. Um, if you start peering, uh, you get a, a limited routing uh, table and you only exchange your customer routes. So you need to be connected to a lot of peers to be able to uh, get uh, connected to the internet. Uh, to the full internet and typically uh, most providers, most ISPs have more uh, peering connections and peers than they have upstream providers. Um, it's a uh, supplier customer relation if you look at transit and, and with peers there's not a real transactional uh, behavior and, and uh, the picture could apply uh, to both the situations where uh, a supplier and a customer have uh, some discussions, but with peers you can have discussions as well. And we within Global Crossing, we, we have about uh, short of 70 peers. We have those discussions as well with our peers. Uh, with transit, uh, it's typically covered by an SLA and with peering it's often uh, omitted. You, you do have uh, some SLAs, but most of the time it's just, well, if there's an issue, you both discuss how you can uh, resolve it. Um, what's also important is transit is a metered service, so there's some benefits if you have more volume, and peering is uh, relatively uh, fixed cost, so you have an interconnect and you can send as much in traffic over that interconnect as you want to a certain uh, degree. Um, if you look at transit, transit is a commodity, hence the price uh, decrease. Uh, you have multiple supplies to choose from, and, and a peer that can be a monopoly. Uh, a peer can have certain customers by itself, and they can play upon uh, their monopoly as well. Uh, this is a very basic uh, <laughs> uh, internet model. Uh, you, you have tier ones, you have content providers, tier twos who, or tier threes who, who offer access services and you have the eyeballs. And that's more or less the internet. Everyone wants to be able to see content or uh, uh, wants to reach the eyeballs, uh, depending on wh which side you look at it. Um, if you look at a transit provider, they play an aggregator role. A, a tier one or a tier two, they play an aggregator. Not everyone in the internet can be connected directly to each other. If we own, if there's only peering in the internet, everyone needs to be connected to each other, because you only announce your customers to your peers. And if you have, uh, if you want to be connected, if you want to do everything by peering, you need to be connected to everyone. That will never happen. So, transit is a model which we will need uh, in the internet for it to work. Um, if you look at the economical model for peering, and this is a, a slide or a picture from uh, from Dr. Peering, um, it, it firstly says, well, it depends on the price per megabit and how much traffic you have. Now, if you look at uh, from the same uh, Dr. Peering, the uh, internet transit uh, price, it firstly goes to zero. That's not the case, uh, as we as we know, but you could ask yourself, well, why are we in this business? Uh, because with such price declines, uh, it becomes very challenging. Also, that's one of the reasons why Bart said uh, some of the, the, the integration that's being done on the internet. Um, traffic continues to grow as well. Uh, I think everyone knows the, uh, uh, the Cisco uh, uh, figures, uh, which are published on, on, on an annual uh, basis, which still uh, see a lot of growth coming up. So what does this do to, to the transit versus peering uh, economical uh, model? I, I did some calculations and, and some analysis on, well, if you go to M6 or D6, what does uh, an internet port cost you per megabit? And you see on a gig E, it's about 50 cents for a gig E uh, port. And with 10 gig and 100 gig, which is available on, on M6 right now, it, it go, drops down to, well, say, 15 uh, cents. Well, with the internet exchange port, you're not there. You also need your co-location and your capacity towards your internet exchange. And if you add that to it, you come at a pretty high prices just for your basic connectivity. The issue here is as well, if you, uh, the more you traffic you have, the less important your co-location costs become. But if you look at your backhaul costs, that's still a high chunk of your cost to do peering. 
And as 10G is still the most common used uh, transport uh, uh, mechanism, and 10G is also the ports which you connect to the internet exchange, that becomes an issue for your cost basis uh, uh, for, to do peering. So the economical mo model, which Dr. Peering says, has a, 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 a kind of a threshold depending on the backhaul cost. Yeah. 100G will come available, but it's not available yet at commercial attractive prices. What I did here is I included for 10G, 3,000 uh, uh, euros for 10G, and for 100G, I included 25,000 euros for, 10, for a 100G uh, connection in Europe, which is perhaps even on the low side, if you look at the interface costs, which you have to pay right now. So if you, why and when would you peer? Looking at the backhaul costs, um, peering is more, becomes more and more local optimization. As, and local can be city, country, or continent. But it becomes less important to start peering, for instance, as a European carrier in North America, or, for instance, as a uh, French carrier in Germany. So you see more and more peerings going more national. Uh, another benefit of, of, of peering is diversity and redundancy in combination with transit. So if something happens with your transit provider or with your peering interconnect, you still have your redundancy there. Uh, quality, you have more control over your routing and more direct connections if you peer, uh, so that will certainly give you some, some improved latency as well. Um, you have less dependency on your transit providers, so if, and we do have customers who give up all their peering and say, well, you handle everything for us. Um, but then they are really dependent upon either Global Crossing or they have a second or a third uh, provider as well. Peering is also important to do relationship building, and also uh, it's a strong community, so you get you know what prices are in the market for transit and etc. So so you can get a lot of information out of your uh, peering relations as well. And of course, there's the historical reasons and the peering culture in the country. Um, if you've al always done peering, it's very difficult and a hard decision to move away from peering. Uh, so, but if there are internet exchanges, uh, uh, carrier, da carrier neutral data centers, it's a very good thing to do and a very opportune thing to do. Um, but you could wonder whether that's the right decision still. Um, if you look at some of the challenges, uh, you need more IP routing skill, uh, IP knowledge and routing knowledge to do peering relations than if you just buy transit. Um, peering can and will require more negotiation skills um, and can be less uh, straightforward. Uh, problem resolutions might be slower and it requires m more staff than just tra transit. Uh, you need uh, people to be involved in the peering community to make it really worthwhile. Um, but you also typically have much more, many more peers than you have transit providers. So uh, we see some companies say, well, why would I need all that personnel, and uh, it's, it's not, not a pop popular message uh, perhaps, but you, 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 you could debate, well, do I want to do this or do I just move everything to my upstream provider? Yeah, that's one. And, and there's also the risk of deep hearing. Um, uh, you should not underestimate that. Uh, what we do see in some countries uh, in Western Europe is that sometimes uh, our customers lose their peering relation with the incumbent, or they don't want to pay as much for the peering relation with the incumbent, and then they go to their upstream provider and say, well, you handle that peering relation. So you make the peering relation or the access towards the, the, the place which are more difficult to handle, you move that towards your transit provider. And that, that's a thing which you can do as well. So to peer or not to peer, uh, um, this is a peer review in school. Uh, uh, I need uh, three classmates uh, to edit your uh, paper before you turn it in. But it uh, depends on the situation where the peer review is always right. And in this case, it might not always be uh, the right thing uh, to do. Uh, but it, it depends on the situation, uh, I think. And we see more and more regional and uh, local uh, peering, and we see less international peering. That's it uh, for me. 
Yeah, that closes uh, our presentation. Uh, are there any questions? If not, then uh, thank you for your attention. As you can see, I'm sorry, one question. One there Uh, I have one question about the uh, integrated uh, security with your uh, cloud computing. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Well, the thing is that uh, when you uh, apply, uh, well, two two questions uh, actually. The first one, uh, don't you fear that when applying uh, integrated security to your uh, cloud computing, uh, this will create a lot of hassle because uh, the more content you uh, try to filter out. Uh, the more problem, uh, the, the bigger problem it becomes because uh, when you don't filter anything at all, uh, well, you, you don't have to uh, uh, keep an eye on, on the traffic. Everything goes through, no problem for you. No, okay. exactly, but that's why we s discuss with our customer the profile and the security profile and the security strategy. So it will be could be different for a lot of customers. So it's not something which you can apply to every customer. Well, this is the way we do it. And yeah, that's the case. But the question is, uh, uh, w will it not be uh, much of a problem? When when every or, or, or almost every customer will have to uh, w will want to have a different profile, and uh, what to do then? You, you yeah, but but typically you will see that you can define a number of profiles, and most customers will fit in in a certain profile. And it's also something, of course, which you negotiate with your customer. If they want something very dedicated, it will become uh, a, a different price tag, perhaps as well. So uh, you, you can discuss it uh, with, with your customer how you want to do that. Okay, and the second question. Uh, uh, when you want to filter or, or ins inspect traffic, well, inspection means uh, less privacy. And uh, uh, don't you fear that maybe your customers will, would not like to renounce their privacy for their security? Of course, yeah, yeah. But they come to us and ask them to do uh, security, so we can then say, well, this is what we can do for you. And you know as well that in an enterprise environment, uh, the privacy is a bit different than in the uh, uh, consumer market. I mean, if I go to a certain website uh, on our company uh, 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 internet, I often get a message, you're not allowed to visit th this web page. And so if I, for instance, uh, uh, Hotmail, I can't access Hotmail on my uh, uh, on my company uh, website. So there's already a lot of privacy <laughs> being broken on, on the enterprise market. But again, that is something we should negotiate with your enterprise customer. It's not something which we say, well, this is the way you need to do it. Okay, so I understand you have high hopes for this to, to be a success, right? Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Then thank you for your uh, attention. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to come uh, around on our booth. Uh, thank you.